The Overton Window, named after American political scientist Joseph Overton, is an idea within sociology that tries to explain why some ideas, especially within politics, are considered acceptable, while others are discarded as radical, and how these can change over time. Overton believed that at any time, there are a certain set of ideas that constitute the norm. All other ideas exist in reference to these norms and are deemed acceptable or radical depending on how far from the norm they stray. Imagine you have a piece of paper and a rectangular piece of glass like a ruler. On the paper are various political positions from left wing to right wing. Where on the paper you place the ruler is where the current norm and acceptable realm of discourse is. You can move the ruler to the left or to the right, but you cannot change the length of the ruler. That is the Overton window. Our ruler also includes a scale that begins in the middle and stretches toward the edges. The middle of the ruler is marked policy, meaning that which is the current norm. Next to that on both sides is popular, ideas that are close to becoming the norm but might still have some detractors. Then the scale goes sensible, acceptable, radical, and lastly, unthinkable. Unthinkable is basically everything that is not under the Overton window. Ideas so radical that no one will take or propose them seriously in public discourse. But that's all very abstract. So let's use a concrete example, the American healthcare system. The concept of an individual mandate that everyone be required to have health insurance by law was first proposed in 1989 by conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation, as an alternative to single payer healthcare. Republican governor Mitt Romney implemented individual mandate in Massachusetts and was lauded by his fellow conservatives for doing so. Jim DeMint, a Tea Party Republican state senator from South Carolina, praised Mitt Romney during his 2008 presidential campaign, saying he had the ability to, quote, take some good conservative ideas like private health insurance and apply them to the need to have everyone insured. So the individual mandate was at the time considered a right-wing conservative idea, because the alternative it was going up against was a single-payer system. As Mitt Romney put it, if we don't do it, the Democrats will. If the Democrats do it, it will be socialized medicine. It'll be government-managed care. It will be what's known as Hillary Care or Barack Obama Care or whatever you want to call it. And on March 23rd, 2010, President Barack Obama signed into law the Affordable Care Act, nicknamed Obamacare, which mandated individual health insurance. Now, Obamacare was a Democrat policy and therefore perceived as left-wing. So the Republicans took a step to the right and stopped advocating for the individual mandate, saying it was government overreach. And thus, the Overton window shifted to the right, leaving a single-payer system outside the acceptable norm. Now, anyone who advocated for a single-payer system would be considered a radical leftist, when before they might have just been considered moderately left. But if we take a trip over the Atlantic to Europe, the Overton window on healthcare is somewhere completely different. Here in Sweden, we've had public health insurance since 1946, and municipal healthcare funds before that since 1931. In the 40s, our conservative party was against the idea, but they were in the minority, so the reform was pushed through. And today, that very same conservative party knows that they can't run on opposing a policy that is so universally popular. The most right-wing policies on healthcare you can find that still fall within the Overton window are things like expanding so-called freedom of choice in healthcare, where patients can choose to attend private healthcare clinics and still have their costs covered by the state. And like, that's still a single-payer system. That's basically what Medicare for All is. But it's considered right-wing here because the normal left-wing position is to shore up public clinics and public hospitals instead of financing private enterprise with tax money. So, could we use the Overton window to our advantage? If we know that the window is best moved by pushing at the edges, would it make sense for someone who is moderately left-wing to push for radical left-wing reform, not because they actually believe in those radical reforms, but because when the window moves to the left, their moderate left-wing position might become the norm, or even moderately right-wing in comparison to the new left? In psychology, there is a concept known as anchoring. Anchoring refers to a cognitive bias we have where we judge something based on a particular reference point, or anchor. A good example of this is sales. If we see an item, like say a pair of shoes, that costs $300, we might think, I don't know, that's a bit much. But if the pair of shoes are on sale and it says they used to be $1,000, all of a sudden we think it's a great deal. Another example I've heard is job interviews. 
The first person to specify a number when talking about salary will set the reference point for the rest of the conversation. So as a worker, you would benefit from being the first to name a salary that's on the higher end of things. Because although your would-be employer is likely to haggle you down, they were going to haggle you down no matter what you said, so you might as well start high. If we apply this to politics, we might expect that it would be more effective to initially advocate for a radical reform, then seem like you're willing to compromise by accepting something more moderate. And if the moderate reform is what you wanted in the first place, you essentially didn't have to compromise at all. I recently read a book called Klass i Sverige, or Class in Sweden, that's about the widening class differences in Sweden, and sort of the defeat of social democratic values and rhetoric about the right to dignity and a comfortable life in favor of neoliberalism, where we think of everything in terms of money and capital and the health of the economy. It's a super interesting book, and if you can read Swedish, I can't recommend it heavily enough. But one of the chapters, uh, How the Right Won the Debate, Neoliberal Hegemony in the Privatization Question, written by Dr. Liv Sunnerkrantz, is especially interesting to me uh, and relevant, I think, to this idea of the overtime window because it talks about how arguments and ideas that used to be marginal or fringe eventually became hegemony. And this is a super interesting chapter, and again, I really recommend reading it for yourself if you can, but I'll just quickly summarize the parts that I think are relevant. In 1975, the Swedish Trade Union Confederation, a very big and influential organization here, proposed the idea of employee funds, a so-called socialist version of a sovereign wealth fund, where the Swedish government would tax company profits and give the money to representatives of trade unions who would use it to buy shares in listed companies with the goal of transitioning them to collective employee ownership, or workers' cooperatives. And this caused an uproar among Swedish business owners, and the Swedish Employers' Confederation used their considerable financial assets and uh, networking to launch what essentially amounted to an ideological war. They paid student unions, think tanks, publishing companies, and educational institutions to spread neoliberal arguments and ideas through books, reports, articles, studies, and research projects. Through networking, including with international neoliberal organizations, the Swedish right wing began to dominate mass media. They portrayed themselves as a united front with a single demand, freedoms and rights of the individual. And they were united against one common enemy, the Swedish welfare state which they continually associated with bureaucracy, regulations, the state, politicians, and the quote-unquote elite. And while the neoliberals spoke with one voice, there was no coordinated left-wing opposition. The left was split on the question of privatization. While some were completely against it and tried defending the existing welfare state, some on the left were buying the neoliberal arguments. Maybe the state is too bureaucratic, maybe there are too many regulations, etc. And it's this act of approaching the opposition, approaching the center, that allowed the neoliberal arguments about the supremacy of the private sector to take hold and eventually come to completely dominate politically. I'll read a quote here from the introduction of the chapter. The neoliberal ideology made a wide entrance and was transformed into common sense. Our boundaries of what was conceivable and possible were renegotiated. The neoliberal conceptual apparatus became so embedded in society's idea of itself that it became self-evident. The word hegemony is used in discourse theory to describe such a development. A successful hegemony appears not as forced, but as natural. It becomes such an obvious point of reference that it is appropriated by the opponents. The neoliberal hegemony shift in Sweden at the turning point between the 1980s and the 1990s was made possible by coalition building, rhetorical strategies, and an implementation of the idea of private ownership as the only natural form of ownership. The right and the left treated each other's arguments completely differently. While in the left-wing press, neoliberal arguments were commonly printed and criticized, the neoliberal press didn't mention any left-wing arguments against privatization at all. I feel bad for you. Think about you at all. The left largely didn't disagree with the neoliberal buzzwords like decentralization, democracy, and individual freedom and rights. And so they conceded on some points. They lost ground in this ideological war that the right was fighting. The most significant thing, in my opinion, is that the left started to adopt neoliberal arguments about economic efficiency. 
And there is a historical background to why the Swedish left was already sort of open to the idea of private capital benefiting labor, but I won't get into that today in this video. In 1992, in a rather influential left-wing culture magazine called TLM, there was this article by Stefan Kalian where he tried to defend the welfare state against the neoliberal perspectives that dominated mass media at the time. In it he wrote, If the picture that has been painted in public debate for so many years is to be believed, the public sector is nothing more than a dinosaur doomed to perish, because history and economic reality runs away from it. But the public sector is not some dysfunctional creature to be studied in a natural history museum. Its growth has been a natural solution to the problems created by an increasingly productive industry. It's really morally right that private entrepreneurs should be allowed to make a profit on tax money that I have paid because I want society to nurture and care for the old, the weak, and the sick. Notice what he did there. He defended public enterprise on neoliberal terms talking about economic growth and productivity, and when he talks about taxes, he talks about his tax money. While it looks like he's arguing against neoliberalism, he's actually conceding that ownership and money at their core are private and individual, and only through political force has ownership ever been made public. And that is the story of how the Overton window in Sweden shifted heavily to the right while most people didn't even notice. When you watch political debates in Sweden today, even the most left-wing politicians and activists will use neoliberal arguments without realizing it to defend their policies. Something like access to mental health care might be argued for by saying that it'll increase productivity because it will help people get back to work. And even when the left party was arguing in favor of a six-hour workday, they often did so by pointing to studies showing that it would be financially beneficial to companies because it reduced stress-induced sick days. A nominally socialist party arguing in favor of helping private companies spend less money on their employees. Now that is what I call hegemony. Thank you for watching. Lots of gold when we unite to gain our rights. If they resist, we'll use our might. There is no middle ground. This fight must be one round to victory for liberty. Our class is marching on the shelf.